more folks will be joining um, in the next couple of minutes. Um, but I first, uh, thanks everybody for joining us for our um, iSchool Colloquium today. Um, our speaker today is Ziyu Yao. Um, she is joining us from uh, George Mason University. And I obviously, I immediately lost the window where I have your bio written up to share. Um, so uh, Ziyu Yao is an assistant professor in the Department of Computer Science at George Mason University, where she co-leads the George Mason NLP group. She received her PhD in computer science and engineering from Ohio State University in 2021. She works in natural language processing and artificial intelligence, particularly building natural language interfaces, such as question answering and dialogue systems that can reliably assist humans in knowledge acquisition and task completion. She recently lost, launched Gentopia AI, an open source platform for creating, evaluating, and community sharing augmented language model-based engines. Um, Ziyu, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I'm going to hand it over to you to get started on our talk. Um, folks, if you want to ask questions, like clarifying questions as we're going, go for it. Um, but otherwise, we'll save some time at the end for Q&A. Thank you very much, Andrew. And uh, thanks for having me. Thank you for be, uh, being here, everyone. Uh, so I will start my talk today. Um, so a lot of my research has been about building uh, what I call natural language interfaces, where humans could use natural language to uh, access knowledge and also uh, complete tasks. And when I use this term, it actually covers a lot of uh, like problems such as question answering, dialogue systems, so on and so forth. Uh, so just briefly, uh, the development of uh, those now eyes have uh, went through a, like a really long history. And uh, we start from like a very early day uh, script-based systems, uh, such as Eliza, Shadow, and Ask Jeeves. And quickly we know that, okay, uh, we have to bring some learning-based components where the system could uh, utilize the statistical information to further augment itself and continually adapt itself to fit the human need. And then uh, quickly we start to see uh, the <laughs> use of neural networks in uh, uh, facilitating all of those uh, NLP components. Uh, and uh, more excitingly, uh, we saw birds uh, which uh, are this type of uh, like pre-trained contextualized embedding approaches. Uh, and with those approaches, with those components, um, we can uh, easily uh, obtain like a more uh, like smarter uh, understanding on natural language. And of course, now everyone knows that uh, now we have like more and more focuses on uh, the use of large language models, so LMs. Uh, and, and this is like a really nice figure that I've been using in uh, all of my recent talks. Uh, when, when we are trying to show how uh, those like different language models have evolved from the very early 2019 uh, to nowadays. And it's also very exciting to see uh, a lot like a lot more uh, language models are getting publicly available nowadays. Uh, and you may not imagine that uh, for now we have like like more than 5,000 of LMs uh, based on the numbers that are released on uh, this hugging phase uh, open LM uh, leaderboard. So this is super exciting. Uh, so uh, the use of length models have really uh, transformed the landscape of uh, NLI research. And one of the big thing that uh, we have noticed is uh, the, the uh, paradigm shift uh, from like using like specialized architectures for each individual task to having a single unified architecture, a single and a unified model and system to handle a lot of problems. And here I'm showing uh, one model called uh, Unified SKG that uh, we developed like uh, two years ago, uh, where we show that, okay, you can fine tune one single T5 model to work on a set of like more than 20 uh, structure knowledge grounding problems, such as semantic parsing, question answering, and data to text generation. And very soon uh, we have been seeing that, okay, uh, this like uh, nowadays, like people will really be just using ChatGPT or this type of LM as a unified uh, natural language interface. Uh, and optionally, we want, we want to augment those LMs with plugins and tools uh, allowing it to talk in programming language so, so it can be connected with backend services in some uh, industrial uh, efforts. So th the very interesting thing here is also that uh, with those LMs, uh, we will start to uh, train those LMs to follow our humans' instructions. Uh, so in the end, with this one single unified interface, we can do a lot more tasks that we uh, couldn't imagine uh, in the old day. 
Uh, and with that said, uh, we will also see like more and more frequent use of LMs in a lot of applications uh, in our daily life. But it doesn't mean that uh, we are uh, in a like a perfect uh, state. Uh, there are still a lot of uh, intrinsic challenges, intrinsic problems with uh, LMs themselves. Uh, while in today, I will just focus on two challenges that are more from the human user's perspectives. The first uh, challenge is about the cost of uh, using those uh, LMs. Uh, and in, in this picture, I'm showing the uh, screenshot uh, of that's uh, like the pricing of GPT-4. And it shows that, okay, with GPT-4, uh, with like different supporting different context lens, uh, you, you're, you're going to pay like different amount of US dollar for the same amount of uh, input and output tokens. Uh, and here uh, I'll be only talking about the monetary cost of using those uh, LMs through APIs, but the same idea actually also applies to uh, the computational cost, like how many uh, how many machines, uh, how many elect uh, electric power that you you'll need to consume in order to run those super large uh, LMs. Uh, and and this is a funny figure that I draw uh, in collaboration with uh, the DALI model. Uh, so uh, when you look at these like 1 million tokens for uh, 30 US dollars, uh, you may not feel like, okay, like this is too expensive. You may feel, okay, this is fine, like because it's just $30 for 1 million tokens. Uh, however, if you think about uh, first, uh, in the future, we are going to deploy LM agents that can interact with environments frequently uh, uh, for like even just a single task, then you will know that this 1 million tokens is really not a lot. And on the other hand, uh, when we are trying to democratize uh, this technique, we we'll hope that uh, those language models can be used not only by people in the US or people uh, with like a better, uh, like uh, from the rich countries. We also want these techniques to be used by people from uh, relatively under-reserved communities. And for those people uh, running LM APIs, uh, it's really a really, really uh, expensive activity. Uh, and on the other hand, uh, uh, we have also noticed that um, while uh, GPT-4 or uh, LMs are like a very attractive uh, technique nowadays, uh, using them uh, could end up with like different uh, performance depending on whether you are like a LM tech savvy people or not. Uh, so for example, if you imagine like in the future, teachers will be uh, going to uh, use ChatGPT to design homeworks uh, they may not be. They may not know how to design the best prompt because they are not an expert in LM. They are not an expert in Gen AI. Uh, so in that case, how are they going to fully unleash the power of uh, ChatGPT for their own work? Uh, and the same idea applies to say physicians, policymakers, uh, and other groups. So um, observing those challenges. Uh, in, in my talk today, uh, I'm going to present uh, two projects in my group, uh, trying to address each of them. Uh, in my first project, uh, I'm going to present our very recent uh, research outcome where we uh, uh, research on an LM cascade framework that could help people to save money from calling the expensive LM APIs. And a, a, a general idea is that uh, we could save a lot of cost by uh, knowing which questions uh, should be sent to the relatively cheaper, although also less powerful uh, LM, and which questions need to be sent to the most expensive and the most powerful LM. And then in the second project uh, that I will present today, uh, I will talk about our uh, ongoing work where we do something called a prompt optimization. And that means to automatically find the better prompt uh, to support some uh, LM performance. And more excitingly, uh, we did this in a fully zero shot setting, which is uh, closer to the uh, typical way how uh, common users interact with ChatGPT nowadays. And finally, I will uh, end this talk uh, by uh, briefly mentioning some of the other ongoing efforts in my group. So we are interested in not only like just prompting LMs for like uh, better performance or saving costs, we are also interested in knowing how uh, LMs are working uh, in reasoning and planning tasks. And we found uh, this to be a very important step towards uh, uh, achieving alignment, which is also like a very popular concept nowadays. Uh, and I also want to briefly talk about uh, one of our projects where we apply LMs for education. And this project has received the support from Microsoft uh, Accelerating Foundation Model Research Program. 
All right. So um, I'll start from the very first one. So um, in this project, uh, we are concerning the problem. Uh, basically, how are we going to save cost uh, from using those LMs through APIs? And uh, the general observation uh, we had made is that uh, when we have like different versions of APIs, generally speaking, the more powerful APIs uh, is also uh, more expensive. And here we show the comparison uh, between the price, uh, the pricing of GPT-4 and GPT-3.5. So we all know that uh, GPT-4 is uh, relatively stronger than GPT-3.5. Uh, and uh, if you compare their uh, monetary cost, uh, you will see, also see that, uh, for example, for the input tokens, uh, GPT-4 will be 20 times of the cost uh, compared with the cost of GPT-3.5. And the uh, difference will be like 30 times uh, for the output tokens. So based on this, uh, our group uh, started to think about uh, the question, like how, how are we going to decide like when to use which uh, versions of uh, GPT model so that we can save the monetary cost without sacrificing uh, the task performance. And uh, I'm going to introduce our work that has been uh, recently published at iClear uh, 2024, and it's a collaboration with Microsoft Research and also Virginia Tech. Okay, uh, so our, our idea of cost saving is really straightforward. So uh, so the intuition is that uh, we wanted to send those easy questions uh, to the weaker, relatively weaker, and also, uh, but also cheaper language models to save them money. And uh, this inspired us to build the following LM cascade pipeline. Uh, so specifically, whenever uh, the user send a query, we'll assume that this query will be sent to a weaker LM, which gives us an answer, a weak here. And now uh, we, are, we are going to introduce an important component, uh, which is this LM cascade decision maker. Uh, it will decide whether uh, it wants to take this uh, answer as a final answer or not. So in case it is going to accept this answer, this becomes our final answer. And the cost of answering this query will only be the cost in induced by this uh, weaker LM. But uh, in case the decision maker feels that, oh, this answer may not be reliable and it's better to pass the, the question uh, to a stronger LM, uh, we'll take the final output from the stronger LM as the final answer. And in this case, the cost uh, will be the cost of using the weaker LM initially, plus the cost of uh, calling this stronger LM. Uh, so to summarize, uh, in this cascade framework, uh, we have like a weaker LM, we are training this weaker LM with a stronger LM, and we introduce this uh, LM cascade decision maker components. And the final cost will uh, depend on whether we are going to call this stronger LM or not. And of course, sometimes uh, there will be the cost in the uh, decision making process as well, uh, but it's actually non-cost uh, in our proposed framework, uh, which we'll discuss later. Uh, and in this case, just to clarify, uh, we'll, we'll consider uh, like the final answer to be the answer either from the weaker LM or the stronger LM, depending on whether the cascade decision maker accepted it or not. Uh, and the extreme case will be that either we only use weaker LM or we only use the um, stronger LM. So uh, in fact, uh, the idea of LM cascade uh, was not proposed by us. Uh, it was first proposed by a group of researchers at Stanford and they uh, proposed this interesting framework called uh, Frugal GPT. Uh, but in that in their work, they focus on uh, some like factoid uh, question answering problems uh, rather than reasoning, which is uh, mathematical reasoning, which is uh, the topic that we are uh, more interested. And when they when they build this cascade decision maker, uh, they uh, utilize the textual hints, the textual descriptions of the questions and the initial answer from the weaker LM. And this uh, idea works well in, in fact, uh, factoid uh, question answering problems, but we actually find that it doesn't work well uh, in uh, arithmetic, uh, uh, like uh, mathematics reasoning problems. Uh, so we will talk about this uh, in the next few, uh, like in the, in the, uh, around the end of the experiment section. Okay. Uh, and, and also uh, just, uh, just a very brief background uh, to, uh, audience uh, attendees here who are not familiar with this topic. Uh, when we are concerning uh, using LMs to do reasoning tasks, uh, there are two typical uh, 
uh, like two typical ways how uh, we'd like to formulate the reasoning process, or we'd like to prompt the language model to think about. And these two thought representations uh, are called chain of thoughts or COT, or uh, and a program of thoughts or uh, POT. Uh, so for both of them, they are trying to uh, elaborate on the thinking process, the reasoning process uh, for uh, doing the reasoning task. Uh, but the difference is that uh, in the COT case, uh, we are going to prompt the language model to verbally describe the step-by-step -step reasoning process. While in the POT case, uh, this reasoning process will be described uh, using uh, like a Python or other Python program, or maybe in other programming languages. Uh, although in all of our experiments, we just assume a Python program. Uh, and this is an example uh, of uh, doing LM reasoning on a mathematics uh, reasoning problem. Uh, and this is an example on a days data set uh, where the task is to uh, infer uh, like will be the days uh, following a certain dates. So uh, getting back to our topic of LM cascade. Uh, so uh, the, the key component here is um, the decision maker. So it means to decide when we are going to accept the answer from the weak LM or, uh, or not. And our idea is to uh, measure the uncertainty of the weaker LM itself. Uh, so specifically, if the decision maker knows that the weaker LM is quite uncertain about a certain answer, then this question needs to be uh, passed to the stronger LM. But now the question is, how are we going to do these measurements? So uh, in our work, we propose the idea of uh, looking at how frequently that the LM will sample the same answer. Uh, and, and this actually follows the idea of self-consistency, uh, also published in a recent paper by Google. So the idea is that uh, when we are prompting a language model to give us an answer, we are going to uh, probably to give multiple answers. And then we'll see how often that uh, their answers are generally about the same thing. Uh, if that happens, that, mean, that means the language model is quite certain about this uh, majority voted answer. However, uh, this will not uh, solve the uh, problem completely in our preliminary study. And there are two more questions we need to answer. The first one is, uh, where are we going to do this sampling? So we all know that we want to have like multiple answers, but where comes uh, uh, the source of the answer? And the second question is, uh, once we collected those uh, different answers, how do we quantify the con uh, answer consistency and use that as a, a surrogate metric of the LM's uncertainty? And in this uh, uh, project, I'll present uh, our approaches to diversify the answer sampling and we also uh, will also uh, like utilize those diversified answers in two uh, two categories of approaches based on voting and verification. So for our first group of approaches based on voting, so the idea is that uh, we are going to sample k different answers to answer the the single query, and then we do a simple majority vote, uh, uh, and this gives us uh, this answer denoted as a double here. And now we are going to calculate uh, the consistency of those K answers uh, with this majority vote answer. So it's simply just a frequency check. Uh, and we have to define a threshold when say uh, most of like more than 50% of the uh, K answers are consistently about the same majority voted answer here, then we accept it uh, or otherwise we just reject it. So this will involve this additional threshold definition. And now uh, regarding how are we going to uh, collect those K different answers, uh, we design uh, totally like six different uh, variants. Uh, and in the very first variant, uh, we'll just prompt the language model with the chain of thought or COT here. And we collected K different answers and we apply this formula to get a score. And, and by comparing this score with the threshold, we can make this decision. And this approach is denoted as COT 1D and votes. And similarly, we can do the same, but instead of using a uh, chain of thoughts, now we are going to prompt the length model with program of thoughts or POT. So this gives us another variance of the, the uh, vote-based approach. And now we can do something that's more fun. So uh, as we want to diversify the answer samples, uh, we consider two dimensions. 
in the first dimension, when we consider like uh, using the same thought representation, say COT in both cases, but uh, each time we prompt the weaker LM with a different set of, of a few shot demonstrations. So we denote it as set one and set two. Uh, so from set one, we prompt the weaker LM to give us K1 answers. And from uh, set two, we prompt it to give us K2 answers. And those uh, together K1 plus K2 answers are combined and we just continue this majority voting uh, framework and define the same uh, uh, consistency rates uh, metric uh, and do the vote-based decision making. And because of introducing two different demonstration sets, we now denote this approach as uh, COT or POT 2D. Uh, and similarly, we could also diversify the answer samples by uh, having like more than one thought representation in the prompting process. Uh, so because now we only consider either COT or POT, so that means we have like two thought representations. We prompt the weaker LM once uh, with uh, COT and twice, uh, like second time uh, with POT. And this will give us like another like K, K1 plus K2 answers and we do uh, this uh, majority votes. Uh, and we uh, named this uh, idea as a mixture of thought representation or MOT here. And we denote this approach as MOT, 1D, and votes. And finally, we could also combine uh, both dimensions together. So we diversify the sampling by considering not only two thought representations, but also two demonstration sets. That means uh, when we prompt the weaker LM with COT examples, we consider examples from one set of demonstrations. Uh, while when we uh, prompt the weaker LM uh, with these POT uh, representations, we consider the second, uh, de like a second demonstration sets. Uh, so we denote these variants as a mixture of thoughts and to the uh, votes. Um, so totally, uh, this uh, give us like six different uh, variants in uh, sampling those answers. Although uh, the way how, how we calculate the uh, consistency rates metric uh, is the same. Okay, so in, in addition to the vote-based approaches, uh, we have also tried a simple uh, verification-based approach. And the idea is uh, just that uh, we still want to have like two set of samples by uh, making those answer sampling being more diverse. And from each set, we can perform majority votes to get one answer. And then we simply compare whether these two uh, specific majority voted answers are the same or not. Uh, when they are the same, we consider the weaker LM being very certain about uh, the, its answer. And in this case, we just accept uh, the answer from the weaker LM. But when they are different, we'll just reject uh, this answer. And uh, likewise, uh, we could diversify the sampling by considering two different thought representations or uh, two different uh, demonstration sets. So yeah, so totally uh, this gives us like four different verification-based uh, decision-making approaches. And uh, in comparison, uh, these two uh, categories of approaches have their pros and cons. Uh, for the vote-based approaches, it's more flexible because it allows you to uh, define the threshold and you can tune the threshold to meet your budget constraints. Uh, but on the other hand, it also requires you to do additional engineering work to understand which is the best threshold. Uh, while the verification is completely on the other side, uh, you do not need to do the threshold engineering, but it's also not as flexible as uh, the votes-based approaches. Okay, so um, that summarizes uh, the different approaches we tried in our experiments. And uh, we, uh, we verify those approaches on totally six different data sets. And we also report an average performance here. And uh, in terms of a baselines, uh, we have two approaches based on the weaker, using only the weaker LM, which is GPT 3.5 in our case. And we use them with either COT or POT, and we do multiple sampling uh, and apply self-consistency, which is exactly is, is about like uh, calculating like a majority vote to the answer as the final answer. Uh, and then we also introduce four baselines uh, where we only use the stronger LM, which is GPT-4 in our case. And similarly, uh, GPT-4 can be used together with a uh, chain of thought or program of thoughts. And we consider variants when uh, we use them with self-consistency or just performing one greedy search. So as you could imagine, uh, using GPT-4 will be the most expensive uh, approach. 
uh, and using 3.5 is the least expensive one, but it won't give us the good results. Okay, uh, so we present our result here. So as expected, the two uh, baseline, GPT 3.5 baseline, uh, they uh, introduced the lowest cost, but also the lowest performance. While the four different uh, GPT-4 uh, variants, they give us the best of, uh, performance, uh, but also the highest cost. Uh, while those slides are the uh, results from the six different votes based approaches, and they are obtained by tuning the threshold. And we also have a few dots, uh, which are like, which have uh, are overlapped with the, the curve, so they are not clearly visualized, but those are the four different uh, verification based uh, approaches. So from this result, we can clearly see that uh, with the uh, like the, the violet light here, which are the like a mixture of thoughts. So with this MOT approach, uh, we can obtain like a very good trade-off uh, between uh, the monetary cost and the model performance. And, and actually we can see that uh, with relatively like 40% of the cost compared with uh, theoretically using GPT-4, uh, the, strong, the stronger LM in any case, uh, we can like save a lot of costs and in the meantime obtain like a really, really close and comparable performance. Uh, and we also find that in some specific data sets, uh, this uh, thought mix mixture of thoughts representation can give us like an even better uh, performance than theoretically using GPT-4. And in the meantime, again, uh, they need roughly like 50% of the total cost. Uh, so to to con uh, to summarize, like, our observations show that uh, it's really possible to uh, save the cost from using those LM APIs as long as you can uh, have a better way to decide uh, when those questions need to be sent to the stronger or the weaker LMs. Uh, and in our research, we also find that uh, having different thought representations is really the key for uh, making this LM cascade framework work so effectively. Uh, and specifically, we find that uh, when we mixing different thought representations, uh, we can actually uh, more easily distinguish between the easy and the hard questions. Uh, and this is shown uh, in the, the bar uh, chart analysis here, where we uh, show the average consistency rates of three different votes based approaches. Uh, and and the, the blue bar here shows the uh, average consistency uh, consistency rates for those easy questions, meaning questions that uh, can be correctly solved with a weaker LM, while the green bar uh, is for the uh, average consistency rates on the harder questions, meaning questions that are incorrectly solved by the weaker LM. So a larger gap can help us to distinguish between these two types so, so we can better uh, build up this like cascade uh, decision making. Uh, so uh, on average, we do see that mix, mixing the thought representation can lead to a larger gap. Uh, and this advantage is even more prominent on this specific data set called Navigates. And we also uh, like qualitatively uh, look at how different thought representations could uh, give us like different uh, on this, like different pers show different perspectives from the weaker LM. Uh, so for example, here we show one uh, mathematics reasoning problem from the GSM AK datasets. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the details, but what we really found was that uh, when you prompt the uh, LM with chain of thought representation, even using different uh, demonstration sets, uh, the type of mistakes made by uh, the LM can be very, very similar, although they are not like uh, exactly the same uh, in terms of the, like, the language variation. Uh, however, the mistake that made by a different like program of thought representation uh, could be completely different. Uh, so with that, what we realized was that uh, when we have different thought representations, uh, they are they can be understood as like diverse, diversified opinions from the same LMs on the same uh, question. And when we're mixing them together, uh, we'll be able to, uh, more easily understand like whether the language model is really certain about the decision that it makes or not. Yeah, and interestingly, this also applied uh, to some factoid reasoning problems. Uh, and here I uh, we show the example on this strategy QA data sets. Uh, so this data set uh, is 
uh, in this data set, like the language model will be presented with a question like this. And to solve this question, the language model will need to uh, like infer some implicit reasoning steps uh, that is not uh, directly uh, spoken out in the question itself. Uh, so for this specific question, it's asking like, is a curling iron necessary uh, in curling? Uh, so the answer should be no, because curling is, uh, is a kind of sport, while curling iron is the tool that people use to make their hair curly. Uh, so uh, when we prompt the language model uh, with the COT representation, we find that the language model could easily hallucinate. The language model would not be able to uh, give out like a correct reasoning step. However, when we prompt the language model with the program of thought POT here, we find that the way that language model solves this problem can be completely different. So specifically, it starts by enumerating the necessary equipment by, uh, for, for this curling, this type of sports. Uh, and the second line, I think is quite redundant, while the last line is really interesting. So it, it gives an answer by checking whether curling iron is within the list of necessary equipment for curling. So with that, we can clearly see that like POT and COT, they solve the same problem in very, very different ways. And we, and we believe that uh, this can be a very interesting topic in the future to understand how different thought representations can encourage the, the value alignments of uh, language models. Okay. And, um, and, and uh, finally, in our paper, we also uh, provided a comparison with uh, text-based verifiers. Uh, as we said, like uh, LM cascade was not proposed by us. It was first proposed by this frugal GPT framework. Uh, but in this framework, they, they use the textual hints rather than checking the answer consistency or the answer frequency uh, when they uh, make the cascade decision making. So we also compare with this type of approaches. And we introduced first uh, two uh, baselines, uh, LMQA and fine-tuned QA. So they follow exactly the same LM cascade as we did, but uh, instead of counting the answer consistency for decision-making, uh, the LMQA will directly prompt the GPT 3.5 and asking it like, do you think I should accept the answer or not? Or I, I forgot a specific prompt, but it's like just asking the GPT 3.5 uh, to make a decision based on the query and the answer from the weaker LM. Uh, and the fine-tuned QA uh, will replace the GPT 3.5 with a fine-tuned Robota model. And in addition, we also fo follow the frugal GPT paper to define two of uh, the other approaches, LMQ and fine-tuned Q. Uh, so these two approaches uh, do not follow the cascade design, so they uh, directly prompt the language model to pick either the weaker or the stronger LM. Uh, so, so in this case, um, the language model will have to, the decision maker have to make this decision based on only the query uh, without looking at like the initial answer from the weaker LM. So interestingly, uh, we did not observe any uh, like advantage, any strengths uh, from uh, any of these four baseline approaches. And as you could see, like they generally lead to like much, uh, like a much uh, lower cost, uh, but also much lower task accuracy uh, compared with our approach. Uh, so what we conclude and, and find out by uh, performing detailed analysis was that uh, for reasoning problems, uh, it could be just too challenging to decide the uh, question easiness or the question difficulty or the correctness of the answer based on only the textual hints. Uh, so, so in the end, we find that uh, counting the frequency of the answers, checking the answer consistency is still like a more reliable approach to understand the uncertainty of a language model. Uh, in our paper, we have included other uh, findings, but considering the time, I'll, I'll not go to the details, but that also, uh, but that include, for example, how weak can a weaker LM be? So we tried the open source LAMA 13 BDM model, and the conclusion is that it cannot be too weak. So if, if the model is too weak, then most of the questions will be directly passed to the stronger LM, so no cost is saving. Uh, and we also uh, try to see if the output in our cascade, uh, the output from the weaker LM can be the hints to improve the performance of the stronger LM. But we find that uh, like the result is negative and the stronger LM indeed can get confused by the uh, weird answer uh, provided by the weaker LM. So for more details, uh, feel free to check out our papers. Um, 
Yeah, so finally, I will just uh, wrap up the first project uh, by uh, showing some of the interesting things that uh, our group would like to explore in the future. And the first one is still about how do we measure the LM uncertainty? So how do we know when an LM knows uh, it doesn't know? Uh, so this is a really uh, difficult question to answer. And there are also concurrent research work on this topic. Uh, but uh, we, we have also tried uh, some of their approaches and we find that uh, this, like like the best approach to uh, measure the LM uncertainty could be case by case. Uh, it really depends on the specific application you are interested. Uh, and uh, and uh, at least in the reasoning task, we find that mix, mixing those thought representations uh, could be the very promising approach. In the future, it will be interesting to explore not just uh, COT and POT, but also say table-based, uh, tabular-based uh, thoughts representation. Uh, however, a big challenge is also that uh, what about going beyond mathematical reasoning problems, say in uh, text generation, like story generation tasks, there's no way how we can do the voting. So, so in this case, uh, how do we define uh, the, the magic of uh, model uncertainty. So I think this is still a very challenging uh, question. Uh, and on the other hand, uh, we are also get inspired from the uh, promising results in this work to uh, explore how we could generally ensemble multiple uh, LM, so LM powered agents in the future. And uh, I'd like to mention uh, two concurrent work, which also demonstrate the synergy between uh, COT and POT, uh, especially the second word MAMOS here. They, they show that uh, when you instruction tune a language model for mathematical reasoning problems, uh, you can benefit from mixing COT and POT in your training data. Uh, however, generally speaking, uh, we'd like to see, okay, in the future when we have, say, in-house versus closed APIs, domain-specific versus domain-general uh, language models, then how do we uh, have a decision maker that can uh, test a cohort of LMs uh, for, for the specific task? And how could uh, the, the entire framework to decide which LMs to use uh, with those LMs in the loop? Um, yeah, so uh, still the challenge will lies in like, how do we know when LM is uncertain about something or not? Okay, so uh, with that, uh, I'll just uh, yeah wrap up the project one. So then uh, in the remaining time, uh, I'll uh, talk about the second project, but uh, I'll just talk like very briefly about this one. Uh, so this this is like the second uh, effort that I want to introduce where we try to optimize the uh, the prompts uh, for users using ChatGPT. And uh, this is still a work under uh, review and is in collaboration with Iowa. Okay. So uh, like uh, in our first project, uh, the scenario we focus on is more about few shot uh, language model prompting. That means you are going to prepare some examples to hint, uh, to guide the language model to do the task. But the more typical uh, case is the zero shot uh, LM prompting. That means you only tell the model what to do, uh, but you do not provide any few shot demonstrations. And it's like the more typical interaction paradigm between users and ChatGPT because like we are just too lazy to prepare examples for every query. Uh, and, and as you could imagine, uh, this would be the very challenging case because you did not show any uh, examples to demonstrate your task to the LM. So uh, to improve the performance, uh, there's one, this magic spell, let's think step by step. Uh, that was a sentence that people proposed to uh, improve the mathematical uh, reasoning task. So this helps, but uh, not a lot, uh, as we sh will show in the experiment later on. And the best practice is still that uh, you have to iteratively and manually revise your prompt design based on how uh, it works uh, in, a, in your application. Uh, therefore, this inspires us to think about how we can automate this uh, prompt optimization process. Uh, so prompt optimization is also not a new topic. Uh, people started to look at this topic uh, since the, like, the, the, the popularization of language model or chat GPT in the very beginning. So you can see the early paper in 2020. However, um, a lot of the existing work uh, started this uh, on a future uh, prompting setting. 
uh, and also at the task level. That means they are trying to infer like a better prompt for the entire, uh, say, question answering task. Uh, and this inference will be based on the future examples that we provided as the training sets. But as we said, uh, we are interested in the zero shot setting uh, because uh, in practice, users will not be able to provide any demonstrations to ChatGPT. In our work, uh, we propose a prompt optimization approach that works at an instance level uh, for zero shot prompting. And the instance means uh, we are going to do the prompt optimization for any individual query that you send uh, to ChatGPT. And our idea is to uh, employ another LM, which we call a meta LM, to oversee the performance of the task LM. And based on its performance, uh, we prompt the meta LM to devise a better uh, prompt to improve the task performance. And this will work because, uh, first of all, although the meta LM does not uh, have access to the future demonstrations for the specific task, it still knows the general, the very common practice about how to prompt this type of task. Uh, and second, in experiments, we do see that uh, a lot of LMs actually have learned about either general or domain specific knowledge, and they will be able to judge the task LMs output and suggest a better prompt accordingly. So with that, uh, we propose our approach called prompted here. Uh, so this approach works uh, roughly in these three steps. So in the first step, we just run uh, the task LM to give us an, an output. And in this case, the prompt is just an initial prompt, like whatever prompt that a user sent to the uh, chat GPT, the task LM model. And likely in this case, like you, you will not get like a really high, like really good performance. And now what we are going to do is to uh, send the initial prompt as long as the task output from the task LM to this meta LM. And then we prompt this meta LM to send back uh, with the better prompt. And, and in this process, we also uh, prompt the meta LM to elaborate on the reason why it believes that the better prompt is a better one. And we also ask it to summarize the current task type. And we find both of them to be very important because they allow the meta LM to sort out its, its mind. So it can understand, okay, the user is asking, is doing like a question answering task. And generally speaking for question answering tasks, there are some things that the, the task LM need to pay attention to. And those will be summarized in the better prompt. And we can run this iteratively until the meta LM uh, cannot recommend like a new prompt. And here we show like two examples, like this is the first rewritten prompt uh, in the end of the first iteration, and this is uh, in a second iteration. So generally we can see like, uh, like increased uh, complexity as the model keep rewriting its prompt. And finally, uh, once we understood like, okay, once we decide like the final prompt, we'll just take the final output from the task LM and just to use like a very easy, like regular expression to extract the final answer for evaluation purpose. So uh, as I said, like the key here uh, lies in how we design this meta LM. And uh, the key components uh, include like prompting the meta LM to reason about the problem and also uh, elaborates on like the specific task type it is working on because we find that that uh, helps the model to elicit like a better prompt rewriting skills. Uh, and in order to do this, uh, we make this meta RMs function as a few shot uh, in context learning problem. And we uh, prepare the 16 demonstrations to show contrastively how uh, the meta RM should rewrite a prompt. And uh, I have one, uh, two examples shown here. Uh, so, so like this is the input from from one like domain specific uh, like cybersecurity domain an ER task, and this is the initial output uh, run by like a GPT four model. So it, it's not correct. Uh, so based on that, uh, we run a meta LM to uh, reason about its outputs and it identifies some mistakes in in the initial outputs and also suggest uh, like a like a more detailed uh, solution uh, instruction to uh, solve this task, include including like uh, showing some domain specific knowledge and also uh, prompting the task LM to give a more like better formatted outputs and also reminded of some like exceptional cases. Uh, and the second example uh, is uh, in the mathematics reasoning uh, task, but similarly we can see like the better 
prompt uh, generally will include more detailed instructions. So, uh, and another uh, uh, question that we wanted to explore uh, before I jump to the experimental part is, uh, when we are going to uh, like improve the performance of the task LM and say now we ha we let a meta LM to access the output from the task LM, should we directly rewrite the input prompt or should we refine the LM output directly? So uh, in terms of rewriting output prompt, uh, this is actually like also the widely adopted strategy in recent years. And it's a generalized formulation of uh, this like self-refinement approach where they uh, directly ask the meta LM uh, to rewrite the output based on the feedback uh, that it uh, uh, generates. While in our case, uh, we have the loop going up to here to directly uh, rewrite a prompt. So intuitively, we believe a rewriting prompt will be the better strategy than refining the output because rewriting the input prompt will allow the model to rectify any more fundamental mistakes, while uh, re refining the outputs uh, will be limited to only local fixes. And uh, we also show this in experiments, uh, considering the time, I'll just speed up a little bit. So we did like a very comprehensive set of experiments and we finally showed that when we use uh, meta LM and uh, GPT-4 as both the meta and the task LMs, uh, we can indeed like uh, have like a performance jump compared with the naive zero shot and zero shot COT. And this is also more reliable than uh, refining the output, uh, which again, as we said, uh, it's only mostly about just performing local fixes. Yeah. Um, and finally, uh, for this project, I really want to uh, show this very, very exciting finding. So, uh, so, so far, how our approach works is by having a meta LM to rewrite a prompt uh, for a task LM. Then the interesting question is, for this meta LM, does it need to be equally strong as the task LM? Or can we use a relatively weaker meta LM to oversee the performance of a stronger uh, task LM? Uh, and while we are doing our research, we have seen a recent initiative of uh, super, called super alignment from OpenAI, and they are exploring like a similar idea where they imagine in the future the human supervisor will be the much weaker side compared with the machine student. So in this case, how would the supervisor, or is it still possible for the supervisor uh, to oversee the performance of this stronger machine student? And accordingly, we want to answer like, can this like can we use a weaker uh, meta LM? to oversee the performance of a stronger LM and do the same uh, prompt optimization. Uh, so I'll just skip the details and theoretically show you that actually the answer is quite positive. And we show that when we use GPT 3.5 to oversee the, uh, like GPT 4 as a task uh, LM, we can actually obtain like a comparable performance uh, than uh, using GPT 4 to oversee itself. So it's saying that uh, actually um, like when when you are just trying to get an LM to evaluate the performance of a task LM, it's actually like an easier task than generation, than a task, original task performance. And we also find that the key here is to allow uh, this uh, meta LM to access the uh, output from the task LM when it makes this uh, revision. Okay. So in the future, uh, we'd like to uh, further explore this prompt optimization to address some AI safety problem. And we also hope it to help us to uh, work on more like domain specific problems. And uh, we'd also like to connect this uh, with some user interface, uh, user in the loop framework. And the, uh, we, I also want to say that, okay, we uh, our group has like spent a lot of efforts uh, along like human in the loop, this line of research. Uh, and we have a recent paper published at ACL 2023 to simulate the user feedback in interactive code generation uh, tasks. Okay, so with that, uh, I will just summarize the two projects that I presented, uh, including like how we can build an LM cascade to save uh, LM uh, monetary cost and how we can do prompt optimization to help users to, um, to find like a better way um, uh, of using an LM. Um, 
So uh, briefly speaking, uh, like our group is also very interested in some interpretability uh, problems and uh, we are very open to collaborations. So uh, I'll just show like one of our ongoing projects. So this is about to uh, understand how LLMs perform arithmetic reasoning by looking at the neuron activation inside. And we do find that the uh, the neural activation is extend shows a relatively positive correlation with the performance of uh, the LLM. So it's showing the promise of predicting how an LLM can reason without actually knowing its uh, reasoning ground truths. And we think this can be a very important component in the future for uh, model alignments. And on the other hand, uh, my group is also uh, have also received funding from Microsoft Research to build LM agents for education. And uh, we'll soon have an archive preprint. Uh, and the idea is to uh, simulate multiple students using LM agents so that the human student can interact with those LM students to practice their mathematical uh, problem skills. Uh, so we picked the mathematics education domain simply because that uh, LMs has shown the promise of solving a lot of mathematical problems uh, in recent years. And we wanted to see if this success can be uh, leveraged to uh, facilitate education. And here we present like a, a example, uh, multi-agents uh, dialogue. And it does show uh, like very detailed uh, classroom discussion about mathematics uh, modeling. Okay, so uh, with that, uh, I will just end my talk and uh, I, I will uh, appreciate the uh, collaborations with uh, people I have been working on, including the funding agency. And for people new to George Mason, uh, we are really close to DC. So if you will swing by, uh, feel free to let me know. And I'll be happy to host you to visit our campus and give a talk. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we've got a bit of time for questions. Steve, I see you have one in the chat. Do you want to go ahead and ask that? Sure. Yeah. Thanks for a really nice talk. This was uh, one really well presented and also super interesting. Um, Thank you. I, I had a question about um, when you're mixing chain of thought and and program of thought. So I, I, as I understand it, that that part of the uh, talk was working on mathematical problems, right? So yeah. my question is, is there, and you got pretty cool gains, especially in terms of efficiency and performance by essentially having an, you know, taking advantage of the variance that you get by asking in the two different ways. I wonder if there's an equivalent for non-mathematical problems. I mean, presumably it's not as simple as just changing a couple words in the prompt. You need this very different style, right, to get the variance yeah. that you benefited from. So, so what do you do for non-math problems? Yeah, that's actually a really, really good question. And uh, we also briefly uh, talk about this in the end. So I, I think the challenge uh, lies in not only how you uh, devise very different thought representations in the in the first uh, first place, and it's also about uh, once you get an output from different thought representations, how do you understand them uh, to come up with this? this uncertainty metric. So I think both are really, really challenging. And also uh, saw some recent work uh, where people use like a tabular representation uh, for some challenging, say, information extraction task. And I find that uh, it could it could like lead to like a better performance. So I, I would say sometimes like which thought representation uh, is the best or is more useful. It, it, it could be like a uh, like a task specific thing. Uh, but generally speaking, I, I think uh, this this like diversifying the thought representation and diversifying the opinions from the same LM uh, will be like a very reliable way to measure the uncertainty of the LM. I hope Thanks. that answers your question. Yeah, no, that's great. And, and pointing out the tabular ones, I've seen some of that. That's yet another one that could serve this kind of purpose. So cool. Thank you so much. Thank you for the question. Any other questions? Feel free to raise your hand. I do see one in the Q and A. Um, I can just read this out loud. Um, so the question is, if we're able to get the uncertainty from weaker LLMs, um, consider a weaker LLM has a single task with three parts. Of those three parts, if one of them is uncertain, can we use a stronger LLM for that particular part? 
I see. So, so the question is, uh, say for some applications, uh, like the output may have like multiple parts, and then you might want to uh, measure the uncertainty for each component, and then you want to pass only the uncertain components to the stronger LM. Yeah. Um. I think I think this is doable. Um. Although I I have not seen a task that that has like multiple components in the output, and and you'd like to measure the uncertainty for each component separately. I'll be interested in uh, having a offline discussion if the this like the people can tell me like which specific task they have in mind. Great, thank you. Thank you. Um, anybody else? All right, if not, um, I think we can wrap it up for today. Um, but again, thank you so much. This was such a great talk and I agree with Steve that it was really well presented and on a really great topic. So we really appreciate you taking the time to come and chat with us today.